How do you even buy one property when you've got a hex debt, let alone go from uni student to $14 million portfolio? I just felt that confidence was not there. I just didn't know how to start. It was almost like dangling a carrot in front of you. Ultimately, you can get it, but you can't because you still study. It's time to hear the intriguing story of someone who started just reading about property in magazines to building a portfolio of now 18 rental properties and counting. This is the story of Oliver Chung's rise to build a huge portfolio alongside degrees in architecture, construction, and the founder of Insight2 Buyers Agency. We unpack a list of the hurdles and blockages he had to overcome to create the success he has today. I ultimately just needed that 30K to allow me to keep going. As his portfolio grew at a young age, Oliver had to explain to family how he was actually getting this done safely. It was a very contentious topic around the dinner table. I then realized that they didn't really understand the concept of equity. Do they know what you've got? Probably going to be a bit of a surprise for them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell all my secrets out <laughs> Never talk to selling agents at the starting point. Always talk to property managers. Never shy away from a problem. There's always a solution to it. If you're uncertain of a market, the number one step would be... This is a story of determination, focus, and an absolute passion for building something big in property. If you want to learn about scaling a portfolio or how someone with multiple degrees secures lending at a young age, you're going to enjoy this episode. My name's Todd Sloan. This is the Pizza and Property Podcast, and you're listening to my chat with Oliver Chung. Oliver Chung. How you going, mate? Good. How are you? Mate, I'm good. I'm, um, I'm pretty pumped to unpack your story. Because it feels like you've just gone from like, oh yeah, like doing some good uh, good deals to like building something pretty awesome to like 18 rental properties. You, you're what, 35? I am. 35 years old. The humble age of 35. Yeah, mate, it's a hell of an achievement. And then there's one thing we'll get into later on in the episode, finding value in any market. And this is one of the things that you've really has been a keystone for you to grow the way that you have. But I wanted to start stuff at the very beginning on the finance side, because you're, you're not like a, a sparky by trade that's just started earning huge coin in your 20s or anything like that, started your own business. You, you've got quite the impressive academic record. You're lecturing at uni in Melbourne. You've got, and correct me if I'm wrong here, a master's in architecture, a bachelor in construction, and there's one more. It escapes me. So let me just, it's a Bachelor of Architectural Studies. There you go, yep. A bachelor of Property and Construction. Property, yep. And finishing off with a Master's of Architecture. And finishing off a Master's of Architecture. Okay. Well, I'm not yet done. So as much as that is incredibly impressive, there is also an incredible hex debt that comes with, with that kind of education level. And this is what I wanted to jump into with you, mate, is how on earth do you build what you've built with that level of tertiary education, when I, I'm talking to people that are like, oh, I can't even buy my first house because my hex debt's killing my serviceability. Can you open this up a bit? Of course, of course. So I guess to get started and to unpack it, there's a bit of a story to it is, I was very motivated from a very young age in property um, as a result studying architecture, right? So I started almost a part-time, full-time hours towards the back end of my first year at uni, and that was working for an architecture firm. Okay, so okay. You're, you're not like uh, scrubbing grills at McDonald's or anything, you're like straight into the profession on like a lower rung. Correct, okay. right. Don't get me wrong, there was a little bit of that later throughout um, my studies, and I'll go through that in a bit more detail. Okay. But, and it came to a point where there was a substantial savings on my end, mm -hmm. and enough to find the first purchase. So what I practically did was I'd seek a mortgage broker to really understand, I guess, the fundamentals of the deposits here, mm -hmm. how, much I, how, how much I could be pre-approved for yep. to, to purchase. The good news came back was I was pre-approved for 400K. What, what age are you now? So that was 19, 19 mm -hmm. going on to 20. You were not, not, okay, so 19, 20 years old. Yes, so that was my first year of, yeah, first into your second year of uni. Uh, okay, first year, second year of uni, and you're approved for 400 grand. How much are you earning working part-time? You must be smashing the hours. <laughs> yeah, so it was on a casual rate, um, and obviously I was maximising the hours. I was learning the ropes of architecture. Mm -hmm. So the good news came back with, I was pre-approved for that amount. The bad news was, unfortunately, I was classified as a part-time slash full-time uni student. Yep. And the banks at the time were not willing to lend or to issue a formal approval. 
So, so it was like you could get it, but you couldn't at the same time. Yeah, so it was almost like dangling with carrots in front of you, yeah. saying that here's a carrot. Um, ultimately, you can get it, but you can't because you're still studying. And like you said, my studies was a six-year time frame to mm-hmm. get a crossover three degrees. Um, so I had two options, right? The first being to wait for the six years to go by and then move into a full-time capacity contract of employment okay. to then allow the banks to fund, um, to issue the first pre-approval to yep. ultimately then purchase. The six years time frame yep. was not an option for me. Well, okay, let's come back there for a little bit and put a pin because I, I don't want to interrupt the story here, but why? Why wasn't it? Why were you so driven? Because six years is a long time, Todd. Well, I, I'm <laughs> totally with you. And, and, and property, you know, the magic of property that, you know, every year you you – you don't get into it. Yeah. Um, the value of property basically compounds with time. But how, how are you knowing this as a 19 year old? That's what I mean. I guess it was by virtue of interest and passion of really understanding, I guess, the fundamentals and really keeping it to the basics um, of learning property at the time. To- at that time, the API magazines were still a big thing. So it was yeah. a lot of reading, a lot of understanding, looking at people's, I guess, success stories in there and saying, I want to be like them one day. Mum and dad pushing you towards it at all? They're investors? Or? A little bit. They're not. Um, they're not professional investors to to what you define a professional investor. Mm-hmm. So what I did was I'm, I'm not going to accept having to, to wait for six years, yep. right? And that's where I started working a solution together with a broker. And I'm like, so tell me what were the key factors or the key hurdles that's going to stop servicing? So obviously it came down to, like you said, hex. And I got the broker to map out two options for me. The option of lending with a hex debt Mm -hmm. and lending with a non-hex debt. As soon as the numbers and the options came through, I guess that was a driving motivation and driving factor to go, well, the first goal that I'm going to put here and (laughs) work towards to is how do I eliminate that hex debt and basically then open up lending. So lucky enough, I guess the bachelor was a three years bachelor Mm -hmm. to then go to a professional full-time employment to then come back and go into the Bachelor of Property Construction and the Masters, right? So it was a three year full-time, gotcha. one year out into professional employment yep, and then back for another three years. So this is the thing that I understand though, just because you've got a degree doesn't mean all of a sudden you're on 200 grand a year or like big dollars. So even though you've gone into full-time employment using your degree that you've got from the first three years of study, I'm assuming you're not making it rain yet finance wise. No. So if it it was knowing what that amount needed to be Mm -hmm. and working backwards with your income and your expenses, so really tightening the expenses part, Mm -hmm. my personal outgoings, right? basically then maximize your savings right and start mapping it out day by day week by week this is how much needs to be put aside to basically pay off the hex debt so i guess that was a driving factor on my end to keep working right to say okay as soon as i would have a full-time employment mm-hmm. right which was the fourth year of after the three years mm-hmm. It will then allow the banks to see a full-time contract backed by a solid history of income, Mm -hmm. right? Remember, I was still working leading up to a full-time contract Mm -hmm. and ultimately then allow me to borrow. I accepted at the time that the hex was still going to be part of the servicing. Yep, okay. Because ultimately, like you said, it's, it's not an easy one and a very, I guess, graduate income. Yep. Um, what roughly was that back then? Just under 55. Pretty modest. Yeah. Okay. So it was really basically controlling the things that I could control mm-hmm. and knowing what an outcome was going to be. So can I just quickly jump in there? So for 1920, that's when you started trying to go, all right, I want to buy property. The broker said, wait a second, here's 400 grand, cool. But you can't have it at the same time. Bit of a tease. Then you're going, all right, well, tell me if I pay off my hex debt, if I don't, give me like snapshots of both situations. You go full into, I'm going to work and I'm going to pay off my hex debt. What year are you buying the first property? So when this is like, all right, the hex debt is now low enough, not completely paid off, but it's low enough that you can jump in. So that was half, six months into my full-time employment. So when you're, what, 20? 
No, that no. was plus three. Because, oh, sorry, yeah, plus three. Okay, right, gotcha. Because that yep, was yep. still three years of three years of. Um, so you're about twenty three ish. Yes, twenty three going into twenty four. Yep. Okay. All right. So I'm just trying to really understand the story here. So that's when you're buying the first one, but your serviceability is now achievable to get in, but it's still kind of shaved because there's still a bit of hex debt there. Correct. Gotcha. Right. Okay. All right. I'm with you now. So that's where I went, okay, well, I know what your banks are going to lend, yep. right? And it wasn't great, yeah. Like, um, in the context of Melbourne, um, I was looking still to invest in the backyard, Melbourne being home. So, again, I had two choice, right? One, to take the pre pre-approval and go and find a market to allow me to purchase, or two, to just sit on it, I can't get the dream house, market's not right, and just allow all of that to fuel and bring me down in the vision. And obviously I took the option of find a market, mm -hmm. what you can get within um, the pre-approval and basically purchase. So I ended up purchasing my first investment property back in, right? Mm -hmm. And there I utilized every options, every grants that were made available to me. So it was a first time owner's grant. It was- Okay, so you lending. moved into it. Correct. Okay. So lending was still at 97% um, lending back back then circa. Because you wouldn't have had a huge deposit because no. you were smashing this hex debt. Yeah, correct. Right. And then the LMI, um, paying the LMI to be in, again, that was, a, that was another contentious topic, mm -hmm. whether to pay the LMI or not pay the LMI. So that became the start of a property journey, right? That was the first goal ticked, right? Mm -hmm. Then finishing that off, um, it was the next three years of university, the tough slog of having to complete the degree while still working. The next goal of mine was, I'm not gonna go into property because I've already got property number one. I'm gonna allow time to do its thing with property one and build the equity. How much time are we talking? So we're talking about four years. So you didn't buy property number two for four years? Yes, because I had another three years of full-time study to go through and the banks were not going to issue a pre-approval to me because I'm back in full-time mode. Okay. But still at the time mm -hmm. working. And, and where was property number one? Talk to me about the deal. So property number one was out in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, mm -hmm. more specifically Ringwood. Ringwood back then was a very different Ringwood to what we know today. So I ended up purchasing... Um, an apartment in a, in a very unique block, very close to the amenities, to the station, to the shopping center. And the reason why I guess I went into Ringwood was purely not even looking at data at that point, but purely on how the investment or how money was being, I guess, thrown into Ringwood. Yep. At the time I was working on, uh, for a builder slash architect on the Box Hill Hospital, right? Mm -hmm. Which was a major tier one upgrade hospital going into $450 million government project spending here. There was a train station upgrade. There was a shopping center, um, Eastland that was going under a massive, massive, um, upgrade. Mm -hmm. There was a hotel going in part of that. Um, so all of that. You're looking at all this infrastructure. Correct. It was more so I was looking really more so infrastructure spend, yep. both from the public sector and ultimately both from the private sector. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was enticing enough to position me in that market, right? Mm -hmm. And then go, well, now I know I want to be there. And for those of you guys that don't know Ringwood, Ringwood is about 40, 40 minutes away from the city, mm -hmm. direct express line um, into Melbourne CBD. So it was ticking the boxes for me, right? It, I was having, it was ticking all the right appeal for me. So position myself, utilize the pre-approval, got in. And I think that's where the value add basically came in. Um, it was it was a very dated apartment. The walls were, were worn out. It just needed that additional love and care just to so bring it So you're renovating it, it? It was, what. so what I say by renovating it, mm -hmm. it's basically just paint, new light fittings, right? Or feature light fittings. So and and it was, but it basically had a courtyard to it. Yep. Um, the courtyard appeal was overgrown courtyard, just didn't have any love and attention to it. It had a decent balcony enough for you to, you know, to have a usable balcony space. Mm -hmm. So yeah, basically bought that first property. And then I'm like, before I moved in, it was going to be paint, 
change the light fittings, and basically tidy the courtyard up. Okay, so very basic cosmetic. Very basic cosmetic. And are you doing this? You rolling your sleeves up? Or are you paying other people to do it? So the courtyard was me, mm-hmm. right? The painting was virtue of, I guess, being in the construction business. Um, it was getting the help from, you know, a couple of acquaintances of people that I was working with. Mm-hmm. And then no different to the um, changing of the electrical light fittings, right? So it was a combination of both, utilising, okay. I guess, professional contacts, mm-hmm. right, um, to ultimately do up property number one. Getting everything started, it sounds like it really is a case of you're paying down that hex debt, you're leveraging pretty high, you're investing close to home. It sounds like you're being property one, no one's ever wearing their, their professional investor hat from the, the get-go, but you're still looking at it through a lens of there's a lot of money being spent here. Like you're chasing it, you're reading the API magazines, you're, you're getting as much knowledge as possible. But then you're going, all right, I'm going to sit on this for a little bit. There's something that I can add a bit of value to. But right now it's time to to just keep working full time and keep studying full time and smashing down the rest of that hex debt. Is That's that it. about fair summation? Yeah, that is a fair summation. Okay. Right? So again, it was basically using the same principles that mm-hmm. I did. It was knowing what that hex debt needed to be, reverse engineering it and going, okay, this is what I need to be able to fund or wipe off the hex debt. So it came to a certain point where mapping out the income mm-hmm. or a full-time slash part-time architecture construction income mm-hmm. was still not going to cut the mustard. So what did you do? So what I did was I got a casual job, right, um, which was seasonal. So it was working as a ticket attendant slash customer service. So it was full stint um, during footy season, working a couple of corporate events. Yeah. Um, so that was pocket money that went not into spending, not into traveling to Europe or whatsoever, but it was money set aside into the hex bucket. I've got to ask, man, what are you doing to keep sane? What are the hobbies? What are the, cause obviously, like you said, you're not going to Europe. You're not going like YOLO. That's, that's not in your DNA at this stage. And, and by the sounds of things, probably not even so much now, like you're very much focused on what you're accomplishing. What are you doing on the weekends? It was working the the stadium job because footy was Friday afternoons, Wednesday evening slash nights, um, Saturday daytime or afternoon shifts, and then Sunday shifts. So it was effectively working that. And then in between, it was unfortunately fueling or feeding the beast at uni and doing the assignments. And um, are you loving uni that much that it's like everyone else looks at this as study and sacrifice, but you're like, nah, this, this is my passion. Is that kind of almost an outlet or are you just that focused? You're like, I don't care. I'm just prepared to slog it out. Unfortunately, uni was such a hard chore to go back and to complete, especially the architecture component, because I knew from the, from the very get go, I wasn't going to make architecture living career. So what I mean by that I was not going to fulfill a career working for an architecture firm. Right. Okay. Yep. I knew at that point I wanted to transition into construction management mm-hmm. that is working for a builder to ultimately deliver commercial projects. Okay. So that's because you're going to enjoy it more, a bit of money or? It was, to be honest, it was twofold. I did enjoy the design part, mm-hmm. but not enough to allow me to enjoy the day to day working in an architecture firm right. as a long term okay. career. Yep. And the construction part was a lot more enjoyable for me where Mm -hmm. where it effectively combined the design part, the people part, Mm -hmm. the banter that you get on your construction site. And I guess the reward was ultimately a lot greater for me, both in terms of what we deliver, Mm -hmm. right? And ultimately financially too. All right. So we're up to what age now? 25, 26? 25, 26. All right, so you've got one property. You're Now you've waited four odd years until we get to, to rental property number two. two. So you and I have spoken on the phone a few times about the importance of finding value to grow. Can you expand on that a little bit and really explain, I guess, how that works when you're really expanding a portfolio? So to me, finding value is really threefold. Right. So number one being you've got to be able to find value within. So what I mean by that is finding value in education to allow you to grow and to expand on. Mm-hmm. 
And why I say education and knowledge is education and knowledge is going to fuel your confidence. It's going to empower you to be armed with knowledge to then make a decision. Okay. To make a confident decision when it's a time to be entering into property. So you reckon it's the lack of knowledge that is responsible for a lot of the analysis paralysis out there? Definitely. I think that's the first part to it is a lack of proper knowledge. And what I mean by proper knowledge is non-biased opinion knowledge, mm -hmm. right? Not knowledge that you see. Someone's trying to sell you something. Correct, yeah. right? Um, or how, you know, mainstream media would try and sell you property or tell yeah. you what markets to go in, mm -hmm. right? So that's first and foremost is finding value within by way of education, education. and like knowledge. It. What's the next part to that? Because I feel like this is like a three-part series the way you're explaining it. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. I think you've really, you've, you, the question really allowed me to dive in a bit more um, to reflect on the journey of 10 years of investing from, you know, one to 18 rental properties. Mm -hmm. um, and it really came down to three parts, right? So the first part being finding value within or in education. And the second part was really finding value in the mindset and the determination and the stamina to keep you going. Because let's face it, it's not an easy journey, right? You've got the emotional roller coaster of going through purchasing property. And at the same time, you've got the financial constraints to allow you to keep growing. I'm still curious what that is for you. Because usually I can talk to someone for a little while and I can peg if they're a carrot or a stick person. I'm still not sure with you. Do you? Because I'm more of a stick person than a carrot person. I, I would like to change that because I feel it's a more positive way to live your life, to be like, I want the shiny thing. I want the shiny experience. But sometimes the fear is a better motivator for me. What would you say you are? Probably the carrot. Yeah? Yeah. So it's more the the real, the, the want for the bigger, the better, the that's yeah. what drives you. Yeah, definitely. To always be a better version. And, and I guess that's testament in... It was never enough. It probably is still not enough. Um, mm. And I guess that's what kept me going or is that, and that's what basically keeps me going. And I remember when I first started, right? All I was concerned was about, I wanna keep going. I wanna buy one, I wanna buy two, I wanna buy three, I wanna buy four, I wanna buy five, right? Mm. And it came to a bit to a point of, why am I doing that? Like, why am I just buying and buying and buying? There was no, I guess the level of sophistication to where I'm at now in the property journey was mm -hmm. not even there on the first couple of purchases, right? There was no, I'm purchasing this property for X, Y, Z reason mm -hmm. to fit in the bigger, in the bigger scheme of things. It was, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, right? Let's keep finding a property that pre-approval is going to fulfill mm -hmm. and let's keep at looking at how we can potentially add value within the property. Right, so that was number two. Mm -hmm. And number three then goes to understanding the constraints that are gonna stop you from growing. Oh, this is a good one. Okay, all right, I've got a few questions around this then because I think being able to really understand what the blockers are can be a massive slingshot to, to really propel you forward. Is there like common blockers you see most people have? Or do you want to open up a couple that like, okay, these were the ones that I faced or how do you want to attack this? Well, it's really twofold, right? It comes down to personality drive determination of what you want in life. And then it equally then comes to the ability to make that vision happen, right? Mm -hmm. And often a lot of people tend to glorify a problem. They'd spend ages and ages making so much noise about the problem rather than shifting that mental stamina, that physical energy mm -hmm. to find the solution. C can you give me a common one that you hear people say? Well, a common one is I enjoy coffee. I enjoy the Melbourne brunch scene of a smashed avocado on toast. I enjoy the pizza. Mm -hmm. I enjoy living the life of a 25 year old, right? Because I've got an income now. Mm -hmm. I can start spending, right? I enjoy going to Europe. I enjoy going to Bali. And let's face it, you've got to live life, right? So it's acknowledging that's the problem. But then how do you still allow property, allow finances to come into the play while still enjoying a, a cup of coffee a day or a week or smashed avocado on toast or mm -hmm. brunch or 
going to Bali or going to Europe while allowing property to, to happen in the background, mm -hmm. right? So by acknowledging that, right, let's say that's a constraint, let's now focus the mental energy, the physical energy into mapping out a solution of, if I want to get into property, how do I get into property? So the first step is either you go to a bank, you go to a mortgage broker and understand, you know, what it's going to look like based on your income and then really start breaking it down into manageable steps that you implement in your day to day life, mm -hmm. right? To allow the smashed avocado on toast, to allow the pizza to keep happening, right? So you're almost talking about taking the parts of the expenses out of your life that maybe don't bring you that kind of happiness or joy, looking at the ones that do, still allowing for it, but maybe on a little bit more of a, a leaner sort of time frame. That's it. Yeah. Whether, you know, if you started off, let's say I was having smashed avocado and toast every single day. Then right? that could be one of the things that's blocking you. Correct. Right. Yep. Then let's maybe think about how do I still allow the smashed avocado and toast to happen every day, uh -huh. right? whether you're doing it at home, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're treating yourself, you know, for that once in a week or once in a fortnight or even once in a month, right? Mm -hmm. To still enjoy the simple pleasures in life while you're managing your expenses to allow the property to fit in. You know, the funny thing is, I think once you start doing it as well, it doesn't leave you. Like Bianca and I took my opera out for, for breakfast uh, just a few weeks ago. And it was like $85 or something. And I remember looking at it and going, like it was a decent breakfast, but it wasn't fancy. It was like, it was like 85 bucks for three of us to have breakfast. The next time we caught up with him, we just picked him up and drove him home and cooked him the same breakfast. And it was like 20 something dollars. It's like, you have the same experience. You still enjoy yourself. And it's like, we're, we're, we're in a position where we can spend $85 on breakfast, but you, you stop looking through that yeah. lens. Like, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so that's, you know, understanding the constraints, mm -hmm. acknowledging the problem, right mm -hmm. and fueling and channeling your energy into well let's start thinking about what the solution is going to be mm -hmm. so to me it's almost like spend 10 seconds yes that's a problem and mm -hmm. focus that entire energy shift into working through a solution that's going to fit both parties right if it's say you and i we enjoy pizza every friday mm -hmm. <laughs> how can we still allow it to happen right whether you come home or you know that once a week is now extended to twice a week or once a month, right? And we've got to real we've got to acknowledge too, right? It's the small habits that we've got to implement to not make it that drastic cut because if it becomes that drastic change in life, it's gonna to be too hard. It's gonna push you out of your comfort zone and um it's just not gonna happen. So for you, when we're talking about value adding, like I was expecting this to go in more like a developing, renovating, like they're actually adding value to the property. But this is really more so like adding value to yourself, education, mindset, identifying what's holding you back. Like it really reminds me of that saying that you, you can't pour from an empty cup. It does because to me it's two parts. The first part is starting with yourself, laying that solid foundation mm -hmm. in you, what's going to fuel your cup, mm -hmm. what's going to tip that cup over and knowing all of his constraints, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's personal, whether it's finance, whether it's career, whether it's values, right? And the reason why I say that is if you don't do that well and consistently, if today I bring a property in front of you, Todd, mm -hmm. and tell you that it's an amazing property, um, you could potentially get X amount in terms of profit if we do that value add, and if you haven't built that solid foundation, either knowledge, mindset, to empower you to make that decision of, yes, Ollie, let's go ahead. You're just going to sit in that constraint and not make that decision. Well, that's what I'm just thinking of someone that has the exact opposite traits to this. They're not educated. They're, they're letting like mainstream media go, oh, housing's terrible. It's unaffordable. It's all of this kind of stuff. Their, their mindset's in like a, a really bad place. It doesn't even have to be in a negative place. It just has to not be in a constructive place and that would already be enough to not propel you forward. And then if they don't really know what's holding them back, whether that's like financially or like more of a within themselves, yeah, the deal of a lifetime could have a hundred grand worth of equity, 200 grand worth of equity, just easy to unlock, but you're not going to pounce on it. You're not going to take it. Yep. Or you utilize the too good to be true excuse or, you know, um, 
mindset. I did that on my first deal. Do, have you ever done that and had to like talk yourself out of it as well? Yeah, often. Yeah? Yeah, but then I go, well, okay, spend 10 seconds on it. Mm-hmm. I know that, you know, that noise is here. Let's move forward. It's just yeah. acknowledge it's there, park it to the side and say, hi, see you later. Let's go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like that, man. Look, and, and I want to start unpacking a little bit more about the the portfolio, but I know that this wasn't all sunshines and rainbows and growth after growth for you. It was pushback from family close to you. There was a lot of like hurdles that you needed to overcome on a personal level. Can Because I know you're not going to be the only one that goes through this, and I'm sure there's a lot of other people out there that are probably going to appreciate a bit more of a, a guidance of how to get through that. So can you open up a little bit more about the issues you faced and how you did overcome them? I wouldn't really say it was pushback, but it was valid concerns. It was um, concerns coming from, I guess, out of love, out of a genuine concern to protect, Mm -hmm. or there was enough alarming bells in, I guess, my behaviour to go, is this property thing that... Ollie is doing now, is this almost alluding to an addiction? And what, what number of rental are you at when this is starting to happen? It was going from probably three, four, you know, to that stage of going to five. It was more so when I was wrapping up on the tail end of the last year of university, um, where it was a hard slog. Um, it was probably the toughest part of uni to get through because mm. Within the last years of a master's, you've got your thesis to go through. And for me, there was two parts to it. There was the property thesis and there was a the design thesis. How many words? They're like 10,000 words or something, aren't they? So the property thesis was 10,000 words, right? Which I enjoyed. Don't get me wrong. I loved that because yep. it was obviously understanding property. But it's like right. writing a small book, really, isn't it? Yeah, that's it, yeah. right? Um, but it was all relevant to what I was doing. I fueled the phases mm-hmm. to really deepen my understanding of property markets, of gentrification, of you know how property markets would move, mm-hmm. and um, what causes you know changes in price or the factors changing catalysts um, to allow markets to grow. So that's why I was so passionate about it that I loved it. Right. Mm, okay. But on the flip side, there was a master's design phases in architecture, which is all about formulating a vision to a need, um, to a brief, and it was very conceptualizing um, architecture. Okay. So it was almost like, think of it as a fairy larder land, right? And that was hard for me to go through, both in terms of producing quality work, because I knew that is it because it wasn't black and white? It wasn't like this is right, this is wrong. It was like a do do what you think is right, but then explain your workings out, that kind of thing? Yes. It was a very subjective and it yeah. was defending defending your phases, which often goes two ways, right? The audience, you know, accepts it, mm-hmm. embraces it, but on the flip side, the audience unpacks it, criticizes it. So that was a challenge of itself. Um and the reason why I say that's where the pushback of a concern became a lot more obvious is I was almost shying away from completing that last year or that last semester of of degree mm-hmm. and fueling the attention more so into properly spending my Saturdays going to opens. So you've um, got family basically on what are you doing, mate? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Family, yeah, like why like it's your last semester, uh-huh. right? You've done six years. Like, just focus your attention, you know, back into finishing kind of this last 12 weeks. And mm-hmm. then it's done, it's dusted, and the world then opens up, right? Mm-hmm. So that was, I guess, where the concern and the pushback came through. And let's face it, all I was doing at family gatherings, so at the dinner table, was realestate.com properly. And that was all I was talking, right? It was basically just almost like absorbing myself into this, you know, this bubble. So you were obsessed. Yeah, correct. And that's where, and that's why the concern came through, um, fueled together with finishing off architecture. Further to that, right, once finishing architecture school and once once finishing off a degree, it then went into, you know, putting offers, offers in, you know, for purchases, going to auctions, you know, not being successful, at the time, I was I still had a very young face, and agents basically just not 
taking you for a serious purchase, so ghosting you, mm-hmm. not returning your calls back. And it was, I guess, driving a bit, the emotion or the bad emotion, I'd say, out of me. Um, from the way they're treating you or from everything that's going on with like family concerns or not really family concerns, but just how real estate, you know, you go to auctions to bid, you get outbid by, you know, you put offers in. And we're talking what, 2014, 2015 now, like this is when the Melbourne market's starting to heat up. Yeah. So 2015, 20, probably the back end of 2015 going into 2016. Okay. So right. Mel- Melbourne's Melbourne's going then. Yeah, correct. And, and you're obviously still buying in Melbourne then? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, obviously it comes through with the emotional roller coaster of the highs and the lows of, you know, trying to purchase property. And I'm sure we all know what it feels like. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think fuel with all of that happening, that's where the pushback and the concern came through. So what did you do to solve it and to kind of keep everything together family-wise and still move forward? So it goes back to the problem and the concern and the pushback is mm-hmm. never going to go away, right? I could do as much as I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. It was always going to stay there from a place of concern. And then it goes back to let's acknowledge your problem, right? Let's have a proper chat about what are you concerned about? Let's start unpeeling the facts over okay. So the first concern came through, well, you're going to put yourself in a financial distress at the rate that you're going. What if something happens here? What if something else happens here? Do you have enough funds to keep going, right? And I think that equally comes from the SOS mum and dad hotline where <laughs> <laughs> when something goes pear shape, yep. ultimately they are here to pick up the pieces. But then when it comes to financial distress, they're looking at it going, these pieces are getting too big for us to help pick correct. up. Correct. And yep. don't get me wrong, they're not sitting on a cash bank account or they, or they themselves were not, you know, seasoned property investors. Mm-hmm. So that was the first part to it. The okay. financial distress that I could potentially put myself in, mm-hmm. right? So that was a core of a problem. How I tackled that was, well, and it was the first time I've actually done that openly with them was, let's look at property number one, let's look at property number two, let's look at property number three and four. I'll show you how the finances are working. I'll show you how much it's coming in, what's going out, right? It's really going down in a very black and white. You explain the cash flow. Correct, yeah, which okay. becomes a very, you can't ar- argue with numbers yeah. as soon as you see it. Then the question came through and says, well, that property that you bought, it's a pretty aged property. What if a hot water system blows, right? Or what if um, something happens? Mm -hmm. So then you channel the what if to yes, I agree. The hot water system can potentially blow on this one. That's what insurance comes in place, right? Then they go, well, what happens if, you know, this door needs repairs? Then you go, well, yes. I've got a contingency fund. There's your slash fund, Mm -hmm. right? Or the SOS property fund, Mm -hmm. property number one or number two. So by virtue of doing that, it gave him that confidence. It gave the parents that confidence that he actually knows what he's doing and it's managed that way, Mm -hmm. right? So that was the number one concern. The number number two two concern went, and again, they were not property investors, Uh right? There, and you're going to laugh at me through this one. Their yeah. concern was like, you're growing a portfolio, you're scaling a property portfolio. Where are you getting the cash or the deposits to keep buying? And as soon as that came out, they said, are you doing unethical stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> to fuel your expensive hobby. Yeah. Because obviously at the same time, you know, they see you going through the emotional roller coasters of going through auctions and, and you know, like mm-hmm. it gets to you. Um, I'm not going to say it doesn't get to you. Yeah. And the more I unpacked that, I then mm-hmm. realized that they didn't really understand or know the concept of equity. So they're looking at this going every time he yep. must be saving up hundreds of thousands that's of dollars. It. Where's that coming from? That's it. Gotcha. And that's why they went to are you mm-hmm. doing, you know, illicit trade that you shouldn't be doing. You didn't say why do you want to buy some? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you can see where that concern and that pushback now comes through. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it was no, well, this is a concept of equity. Mm-hmm. This is what I ultimately just needed that 30K to get me through the door. And from there, it's extracting the equity from one to the other to allow me to keep going. Mm-hmm. And it was just that moment, that light bulb moment that 
came back on their face and they were like, how did you know this? And I'm like, well, you know, all of these magazines that you keep complaining about comes into the post <laughs> box because it's yeah. taking so much space. I'm learning it from this. Well, that's where you're learning it from. That's where you're reading it from. You're talking to, you know, bankers or brokers. And again, um, brokers were not a big thing back then as mm. it is now. So for me, it was talking to bankers, talking to brokers. Uh, uh, is mum and dad property investors now? Like, have you kind of helped them go, oh, I think maybe we can do this too? <laughs> a little bit, but not... I guess to the extent. Um, yeah, they're still a bit more yeah, risk averse. Correct. Very risk averse. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I still remember having the debate of on purchase number one. Yep. Explaining that I'm going to buy insurance. I'm going to go via the NMI pathway to allow me to purchase. Mm -hmm. And it was a bit of a, I guess, no, no. Why would you want to buy insurance? pay something to get yeah it was a very contentious topic around around the dinner table because they couldn't see the value exactly right yeah, yeah. um or they couldn't see that if i didn't do it now mm -hmm. it was waiting for another four years in my case well that was four years of decent growth back Correct. then as well but i mean even putting it back to your piece before it's because it, right then they didn't have the same education level that you had their, their mindset was coming from a place of concern for for their son and and i guess they couldn't really see what was in the way and how you solved it that's it so right and yeah. that's why today in reflection right and when we've had these conversations previously to today mm -hmm. it's on reflection that you go well that's why you never shy away from a problem mm -hmm. you always unpack and find out what's fueling the problem and there's always a solution to it, right? So by unpacking and understanding where that concern came through on their behalf, mm. there was an answer to every sim to every one of them, which by virtue of wrapping up that conversation, they just then kept out of my lane till very much today. Do they know what you've got? Probably going to be a bit of a surprise for them. <laughs> <laughs> it's because it's pretty impressive, man. Like I, I, I want to talk more about the the degrees and how the education that you've got it's not the standard property education it's, it's a very cut above the the rest and how it kind of applies but i i want to kind of go into a quick little anecdote if you've got one though because going from like we've just kind of glossed over going from property number one to like four or five like can you tell us what what's like a high level memorable moment that was a little growing pain and an issue you solved during that those initial few in the journey so by virtue I guess coming from architecture, right? And it's often glorified. It's all the pretty, it's all the nice, it's all the stage elements that mm -hmm. would happen on the back end of a sale. Mm -hmm. And by virtue of going to a lot of opens, it was looking at the glorified pretty houses, inverted commas, and then going on the part of opposites of looking at your houses which were in, in the same street in the same locality in the same suburbs right and i started to see a bit of a i guess my observations were it started to i guess fuel a little bit more to the direction where i now see how we purchase property was mm -hmm. these houses which didn't have any love attention which were very dated in the 80s or the 90s with the wallpaper still on them um, a carpet that effectively just you can smell it through the photos. Exactly. Yep. Right. Um, and exactly the same property, you know, a couple of doors down or a couple of streets away when they were printed up in inverted commas, the prices were quite significantly different. Mm -hmm. And I guess by working in the profession and talking to tradies, um, dealing with architects, being, you know, working for a builder myself, all of that started coming together or there was that light bulb moment for me that, hang on, there's a bit of a gap here and a good enough gap for me to start giving it a bit more love and attention mm -hmm. as opposed to just looking at back then the value add just being new paints, new light bulbs, you know, new grass, tidy up the garden. So for me back then that was value add because that's yep. effectively what I did for property number one and I saw the rewards but the proportion of the value add was quite small to how I now see mm -hmm. potential in adding value in property. And when did you start seeing that? Was it property number two, number three? Like when did this really 
come into play? It was sitting from four to five. I guess the level of experience that you were going in, the mm. level of the obsession that you were going in by virtue of going to opens and looking at these houses in flesh, as opposed to just screening them on real estate, mm -hmm. slowly became a lot more apparent. And almost that too good to be true feeling that you have within. Yeah. So I did a bit more work, investigated it a bit more, um, started tracking. Um, and again, I was still very much focused in Greenwood, in Mitchum, in Box City, in Croydon, into that pocket. And this is what the first, what, five are? Yes. Yeah. Right, within, within that pocket. Again, it was becoming that market expert, if you want to put it that way. And, and, and why, why didn't you diversify sort of sooner? Was it like, I, uh, this is what I know, this is just where I want to stay? Because you're reading the magazines, like surely you're – you understood about the borderless side of things. It was a bit of twofold. Like I was getting to know the agents. I was knowing the market quite well. Um, I was being able to spot that disparity, yep. right? And I did try at that point to position myself in the outer suburb or different suburbs, right? And I just felt that confidence was not there. I just didn't know how to start. Like let's say if I went on the total polar opposite in Melbourne going on the Western side, and I did give that a go, but again, it comes down to that education and knowledge. I just looked at properties, but didn't know, or it was a lot harder and a lot more time extensive for me to spot that disparity. Whereas when I then focused my attention mm -hmm. back into the Eastern suburbs of Melbourne, it was- You could do it quick. Yeah. It was two minutes, you can spot good, no good disparity. So for me, it became staying in that comfort zone of what I knew yeah. till it came to a point where the profit numbers was not as glorified, mm -hmm. um, put it that way. And that's where I'm like, well, I know that market well enough, right? I've capitalized on experience or knowledge and of um, professional team members. Mm -hmm. Now let's start focusing that attention, expanding my wings into elsewhere within Melbourne. Gotcha. Okay. So property number one, there's a little gap for about four years or a decent sized gap actually for about four years. Prop number two, three, four, five. It sounds like they happen in pretty quick succession then, don't they? How? Was there just like such a huge equity uplift from number one that you were like making it rain with equity and deposits everywhere? Or were you adding the value on each one and going again? How is that coming? It was a combination of both. I guess it was timing with, like rightly said, Melbourne started to pick up. Yep. Um, the equity was, was there, right? And enough to then split it into two purchases. The servicing at that time allowed it to happen because lending was a lot easier back then. So it was, everything was fueling in the right direction to allow me to rightfully do so. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it too was drawing back down onto the property thesis of understanding how prices or how people or what would really fuel um, the, the catalyst for prices to move and when you say the property thesis you're talking about literally the thesis you wrote on the gentrification piece yes. Right? yes so i did yep. the case study in footstray which is local to melbourne to yep. really understand you know what would fuel that gentrification mm -hmm. piece in footstray and then it was well let's apply that and start seeing what there was common similarities happening where i was purchasing quite a lot or mm -hmm. looking at markets and then so what i then started to go well if Ringwood was taking its, its going for the stars, as we say, a lot of people who are attracted to what Ringwood has to offer are going to get priced out. So then that's why I started to, I guess, expanding out of Ringwood, going into the outer, outer rings mm -hmm. by looking at the same shifts that I did in the footstray market to then apply that more so into real life context where you can see small signs happening. Let's, let's then go find the houses that would not only perform well, mm -hmm. but then you add the cherry and the cake of where the value add. And by then, my understanding of value add or my concept of value add was a lot more sophisticated to when I initially started. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, that's effectively the journey, the journey of, you know, propelling and leaping forward. Can we open up a little bit about then five, but then to six, seven, eight, nine, ten, to 10, 10, 11, 12, like it, it just kind of keeps yep. going. It, looking at what you know now, and for anyone that's like, hey, look, I've, I've got three or four, like I'm at a decent sized portfolio and, and above what most people in the country will ever achieve, even just yep. being at three or four. But they're like, no, I'm, I really want to get to like 10, 11, 12, 15. Mm -hmm. What are the things that you wish you knew then? You've got to be working with a smart, savvy mortgage broker. And the reason why I say that is when I was moving from five, probably to six, seven, eight, the broker that I was with kept giving me pre-approvals that kept going down in, in, in numbers. Okay. So it was, you know, from, you know, 500 K to then going down to 400 to then going down to 300. So even at one point I had a pre-approval for 200 K. So you could see how you're purchasing and you're borrowing power by virtue of income and started declining. And so you're looking at this going, this isn't sustainable. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And I was like, I can't keep, so I had to pre-approve it at one time for 200 K and I'm like, what market in inner city Melbourne, am I going to be able to purchase for 200 K? You can get a little 30 square meter office somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I'm like, well, again, taking the same, that's a problem. That's mm -hmm. a constraint. Let's now start finding a solution of how I can use that pre-approval. That's moving into 2017, 18-ish time frame. And so what, you ended up ditching this broker or what No, no, happened? no, I still worked with him. Still worked with him, yep, okay. Yeah, because I guess he was bringing, bringing money money in to allow me to then go shop for property. Yeah, okay. Um, and I guess even back then, I guess brokers or the investment savvy brokers were still at the infancy. So I took the option. I'm like, let's go find a market, a property market or a suburb that's going to perform well, but is within that price point. So that's what I did. And I ended up going into regional Victoria, purchased for 169K, a four bedroom house in a regional. I've got to ask, Ballarat, Bendigo? Shepparton. Shep oh, okay, yep. Shepparton. Yeah, yeah. So Shepparton. Shepparton had a major hospital. So for me, that was sufficient enough um, as a starting point to go, let's go have a look at that. And then it had a bigger, I guess, a, a diverse enough industry that it was not only relying on doctors, nurses, and so forth. It had the agricultural part to it. So where some people are going, I'm only approved for 200 grand, it's done, we're capped. You're going, what can I do with 200 grand? And you're trying to just like find yep. the answer again. That's it. You know, knowing that property, mm -hmm. right? Or knowing that market, doing exactly the same research that I did for the other markets that I purchased in. Yeah. Um, talking to agents, you know, several agents to validate, I guess, the same opinion. And my approach was never talk to selling agents at a starting point, always talk to property managers. Why? My view on it is your selling agent we'll try will and sell, sell you whatever dream you want to hear, yep. right? They've got the best property in the best pocket and so forth. Mm -hmm. The property managers are unfortunately the ones that have to deal with the derelicts of a property, of a property, of the people staying in the property. They've got to deal with them all the time. Correct. So yep. I now take that approach mm -hmm. even before I enter any market and that's, I guess, a key note or a key takeaway. If you're uncertain of a market or it's a new property so bad, you say, yeah, maybe I can go into it. The number one step would be talk to the property manager. And I approach it in a way of a concept of, hey, I'm looking to invest in this suburb, Shepparton is an example. My view is whatever stock I give you or whatever house I give you ultimately becomes a problem that you then inherit mm -hmm. by virtue of a property management fees. So you're going to get the truth. Right. So tell me what street, what pocket, mm -hmm. right? You don't want to be managing a property in. Mm -hmm. And suddenly they're like, oh, that guy's going to work with me. Let me make my life easy. And I take the approach, well, let me make your life easy. And often you start by, I'm going to tell all my secrets out here. <laughs> hey, can you give me a management fee as a starting point to manage a property? And then you lead in with, hey, what? properties or what pockets, what streets you want to stay away from. And you do that with a couple of agents to validate everyone's telling you the same story. And that's where you become the local street expert, mm -hmm. right? This is really good, Oliver. I know. Mm. <laughs> so to put it back in perspective, as my confidence grew 
tenfold. Mm -hmm. And as the frameworks that I started using for myself became a lot more sophisticated and I could see the proof in the pudding, mm -hmm. I ventured into state. Okay. Right? And what years is roughly? That was pre COVID. So 2018, 2019. Yep. Right? Okay. So between 2018, 19, I was purchasing in regional Vic. Yep. I became quite confident to purchase unseen and bear in mind, I actually most regional um, properties I've actually never even gotten to see them. Um, yes, yeah, so I became a lot more confident mm -hmm. and I could see that the systems that I had in place for myself were actually working. I took a leap of faith, went, um, started looking at the WA market. Mm -hmm. And again, the pre-approvals that I was getting back then we're getting within that same ballpark figure, you 200 to 250 is by virtue of serviceability. What are you roughly earning back then? Because <laughs> hex debt's gone, yeah? Yep. Yeah? Yes. And, and so what, you're in like 100 grand, 150 grand? That what? was your mid 100 grand. Mid 100 yep. grand. Okay, so you're bringing, starting to bring in some decent money now. Yep. All right, but at this stage, you've got what, 10 or so properties? No, that was about the eight mark. And so what are they roughly yielding? Because I'm assuming your you're inner Melbournes, they're, they're not going to be huge yields, but then if you're going out to Shepparton, you're getting better yields yep. out there. Like what's, do you have like a portfolio average? So it was averaging between five in in Melbourne, yep. right? And then the yields in regional were seven, eight. The Shep one was eight, almost towards a nine. So I'm assuming that that's really what's helping with that serviceability yeah, correct, piece as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to what I was saying is. Yep. So you're venturing into Perth. Yes. 2019. Yep. With a very skinny pre-approval. Yep. Right. And again, starting at a very high level, just going in and saying, okay, what markets can I be in for that amount? Found a market and it was exactly the same. As soon as I typed in the suburb, mm -hmm. right, it was high crime rates. It was all stigma, right? It was all doom and gloom. Shep was a classic example, mm -hmm. what Google says. Let's utilize that same concept, that same framework, and then start unpacking that a bit more. So went across, identified the property managers, looked at their ratings, and then started call calling, taking the same approach. I'm an investor, want to get a fee, a fee proposal to, for you to manage a property as a starting point. Mm -hmm. And that's to show you serious? Correct. Yep. Right. And it wasn't the first question you get, hey, are you interstate or are you local? It was, yeah, okay, send me an email, I'll get it across to you. And that's step number one. And mm -hmm. moving to step number two, you entice to start that conversation. Hey, I'm generally happy with your fee. Let's now and try work together and start getting market knowledge. Okay. So everything was pointing in the right direction. We're telling you good pockets, the bad pockets, where to stay, where not to stay. To ultimately then finding a nice property, what I mean by nice property that was fitting all the boxes for me. So what I did was I had a property that was really sparking my interest in, mm -hmm. right? The due diligence was then moving to the next step of really refining and repolishing it. Yep. That property was located adjacent to a childcare. Okay. Right? So got on the phone, spoke to center manager of a person right hey can you give us a bit of like how's the you know have you had any issues with crime rates and or just generally understanding the feel of um the vibe that the person was giving me have you had any you know shooting drives through or break-ins you know the general did she I say guess, yes to any of that she didn't okay, good <laughs> yeah i'm like have you had your bin stolen had you had graffiti on um she goes no i've been here for about seven years like we occasionally have a burns out burnouts here and there was there a bit of an apprehension in her tone of like who is this guy and why is he asking me these questions no i i guess it depends how you frame it because if you go i'm looking at moving into this suburb right it's like a point of concern right a point of concern and i've got a young family and i'm looking at putting them into this child care i'm generally concerned because obviously the suburb can often have a stigma of high crime rates, yep. young, you know, um, and they're generally quite open and honest with you, which I've found. And you do it a couple of times over, over, or you get a couple, you know, you do a proper due diligence. Mm -hmm. So everything was coming up. Yes, there was a little bit of concern there. We occasionally get burnt out. We've never had our bins stolen. I think only once we've had to reorder bins and whatnot. So they start mapping a bit of a story, story which validates and cross checks with 
remembering all of the other property managers that you're speaking in your background. And this is already highlighting why you're not talking to the sales agent first. Exactly right. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. But you're t- taking a step further. You're not just talking to the property managers. You're then talking to anyone else you feel that you can get like a, a solid, honest, real opinion That's it. out of. Correct. Right. Okay. Often you'll find that the stories either match up uh-huh. or they don't, right? And that's how you start forming a non-biased opinion, mm-hmm. in my view, and um, giving you that confidence and that empowerment then to say, okay, let's purchase. We've done enough due diligence to give that level of comfort. Mm-hmm. that It's good to go further. Talk to me about the confidence to jump into Perth in 2019, because now it's like, it's easy to go, oh, well, of course he did well. But it wasn't then. It, it, like People were like, oh, well, that's the dud area. Like you, you don't put your money there. It hasn't grown in 10 years, all the rest of it. Why, why did you go, nah, I know better? Gut feel, experience. Yeah, it was a lot. I think it to do with that. Like It was more so emotional um, decision on my part. And it was blanketing, you know, it was putting blinkers on. Well, fine, that's what you're saying. Well, from what I've seen across... You know, from my experience and, you know, from, I guess, the phases coming into place, um, having done enough investing Mm -hmm. to give me that level of confidence with the right mindset and right framework to then leap forward across to WA in a market that was very, very flat. So you're kind of looking looking at it like through your gentrification eyes. Correct. it can't stay this way, but mm-hmm. plus because it's been flat for so long, yep. B, it also can't stay that way for that reason. That's it. Right. Okay. And then you started, I mean, then you start looking at government spending, you know, what the next 20 years would be like. And you could slowly start seeing signs that it's something that's going to happen now, mm-hmm. soonish. And let's face it, no one can really, no one has that crystal ball to say, okay, go in and invest in so-and-so suburb because it's going to, it's ripe for growth. Yes, mm-hmm. there's all indicating signs right but when you start putting all of that together Mm -hmm. and i think there's an element of again going back to mindset an element of gut as a level of sentiment too that's the part that's hard to quantify yes and that's a part it's hard to quantify that becomes very subjective and it goes back to your mindset building that foundation were you also putting these deals together in a way that it's like okay if the market goes up in six months, win. But if it doesn't go up for five years, I'm still good. Like the deal works. Correct. Right. The deal works. Right. Um, the cash flow is still there. Mm-hmm. The insurances are there. Right. And it was always making sure your insurance would cover for malicious damage, for loss in rent, default in rent, and mm-hmm. whatnot. So I'm like, well, from a numbers point of view, right? If it's on a positive cash flow, and all your risk measures are in place if you're purchasing in a negative stigma suburb, then what could happen? Mm. Like, and traditionally, property would always, you know, in the long term, go up, right? Bar be, you know, the occasional fluctuations here and there. So I took that approach, that common sense approach, and said, well, the sentiment was there, the confidence was there for me, let's go, let's, let's make it happen. And so you bought a few homes for around the, what, the 200,000-ish mark? Yes. And they're all worth now? Four, high fours. Some of them are going into your fives. Okay, so you've done pretty well out of it. And again, that's, you know, that's putting blinkers on that, on the advice, the, you know, the opinions from, from I guess. Some pretty respected professionals. Yeah, correct. At the time. Yeah, right. okay. And that's why I wanted to ask the question, because I think that sometimes it's, I'm very much a fan, obviously, of the education piece. You, you've got to stay educated and, and continue to push as much as you can. But it's almost like a the, there's a, a coach in a football team for a reason. There's not 20 coaches for a reason. Like, you, you find what works for you, keep narrowing in on it. But there's always going to be those voices going, nah, you're wrong. And it's like, well, if you listen to too many of them, then you do fall in the analysis paralysis piece. And obviously you've done pretty well out of it, mate. Like you, you're sitting here, a very successful 35 year old man with a $14 million portfolio, 15. Oh, depending how you see it, depending at what point, you know, you get, you get all your virus in, but for the purpose of, of yeah. Around there? Yeah. 
Okay, yeah. So you, you're doing good. Like, it's, um, and and talking around the value add side of things. I mean, this is something that we we alluded to in in the very start. Is finding value in any market. You've you've kind of alluded to it a little bit throughout the whole conversation. But as a big sort of real like tangible takeaway, what do people need to keep in mind when it comes to doing essentially what you've done and really finding value no matter what market we're in? Let's park it to the first fundamentals, right? Of understanding what property is, mm -hmm. right? So there's a need or there's a demand and there's um, the people in a product coming in wanting to buy something, right? And each market has a unique demand and has a unique demographic of its own, mm -hmm. right? So for me, it's understanding the need and the demographics of what is it that they need? What is that solution that can address their need or problem solve that need? And in property, it's a home, right? Mm -hmm. It's a tangible element of a home, yeah, right? So that's step one is understanding the proper home for the proper set of uh, of people living in that suburb. Okay. So that's market knowledge. Yep. Second is understanding the dynamics of the market. So demand, supply, and what's really going to trigger the imbalance from demand to supply. And step number three is then really going down into the market gaps, identifying disparity in purchase prices across a one bed to two bed, from two bed to three bed, mm -hmm. right? And that's where, for me, it's unlocking the value into property. And by doing that, you then tap into opportunity. So opportunity of capitalizing on that gap, right? Often it's either stock levels or it's, you know, the demand for free bedroom houses. And is this the same for like unrenovated and renovated and uh, like split blocks versus full size blocks? 100%, right? Okay. So it's really understanding what your market needs, mm -hmm. right? To then say, well, with the current houses that's coming on the market, mm -hmm. are we actually fueling that demand? Okay, because if your demand is for full-size blocks and you're like, wow, there's this huge gap between full-size and split blocks, but there's no demand for it, no it doesn't one's matter if the gap's there. Correct, and gotcha. no one's going to pay for it. Yep. So that's the first part. And even better, to amplify value in a more sophisticated and smarter way is what is that unique feature, right, that I can add to that disparity that no one else is doing but it's going to allow someone to pay a higher price for. I know we're going to run over time, but I want to ask you this question. Can you give an example of that? Because I feel like you're touching on something really important there. So when, I, when you refer to uniqueness in the property market, as an example, we know, um, let's say we're positioning ourselves in a suburb that we know a two bedroom um, unit is in massive demand for whatever reason, right? Mm. But the market in itself only has the majority of the stock, past, present, and future mm -hmm. is only one bed, occasional two beds, right? So we know either your owner ox or your investors who see that demand and will capitalize on that demand, we then need to find that unique one bedroom property, mm -hmm. right? To then convert it into a two bedroom property. And we know that converting a one, or I know from experience and working in the field, finding a large one bedroom property to be able to convert it into a two bedroom is a very hard ask. So that's where I say by the uniqueness of the opportunity to then capitalize on a product, mm -hmm. right? That has a strong demand for it, right? To allow us to, to find value or to add value. I like this because you're not saying this is like a, hey, here's an easy thing everyone can do. It's like, no, find the tricky thing. Find that thing that people are demanding that they really want that is probably a little bit rarer, that you're not just going to be able to log on realestate.com in four minutes and see it straight yeah. in front of you. But if you can spot that, this is really finding value, whether the, the market's like absolutely stagnant or, or going, so it doesn't matter, you're spotting that value. Yep, 100%. It's okay. knowing how to spot that value. And it's by virtue of just time and effort and experience in knowing your market. That's why I go back to education knowledge to allow you to then empower and find that gap. 
Oliver, you've grown a massive portfolio, mate. You're very humble about it. Like even just talking before, you're like, oh yeah, it's all right. <laughs> it's huge. Like you should be super proud of yourself. I hope you are. Now, I, I wanted you to leave everyone with a bit of an action step for people that are listening to you going like, I'm pumped about this. I want to scale things the way that Oliver has. What's one action step that they can pull out the headphones right now and put into practice to start walking down a similar path? I'm going to challenge you here, right? Okay. I'm, going to, I'm going to give you two. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Forever the deal maker. <laughs> because both of them stem from my personal experience, right? Okay. So the first one is something that you can do in two weeks, in four weeks, right? Uh-huh. Find a mortgage broker yep. that has the capacity, the knowledge, and the skill set to map out what your finance lending power looks like in the next couple of years for you, for your unique circumstances. Mm -hmm. Do not use an online calculator and think no. that's that. Yep. And the reason why I say that is no finance, mm -hmm. no property, no growth. Mm. So you okay. can ease it. That's one action takeaway that you can do in the next four weeks. So find you can a start solid. and you can finish that step process. All right. So finding an investment savvy broker, getting your pre-approvals out or not even getting pre-approvals, just like knowing what's your situation, what you yep. can borrow. Number one, it's only supposed to be one, Oliver, but all right. What's, what's number two though? <laughs> so number two is one that's going to take a bit more effort, Okay. right? A bit more practice on a day-to-day -day basis is acknowledge a problem. Mm-hmm. And use a 10 second rule to acknowledge, say hi to it, mm -hmm. say see you later. That's step one. Step two is then channel your mental energy, your physical energy to glorify the solution, not the problem. Okay. I feel like you've just snuck a third in there, but um, <laughs> so you're basically going acknowledge what's wrong then focus on the solution. But you use the word like glorify the solution. So basically putting that that solution on a pedestal and really making like this, this is my my go-to, this is my – and is that to, to get that, that mindset, that feeling, that positivity behind like this is doable? I 100% because the more energy, time, and effort you spend on crafting a solution, mm -hmm. right, and most of the time it's not the right solution that comes up front up, right? is you're channeling your time into a positive outcome mm -hmm. that you have a power to control mm. and to influence a change in your property journey. Well, speaking of the time side of things, it's probably time for you and I to grab a late lunch, which I'm going to use as a very lazy segue for the most important <laughs> question of the entire show. Oliver Chung, what is your favourite pizza? It would have to be a trio of mushrooms. Tree of mushrooms. A trio of oh, mushrooms. Oh, trio of mushrooms. Yes. Okay. It's gonna say that sounds like a heavy pizza. Where are you getting it from? Favorite spot would be DOC in Melbourne. Where's that? It's in Car oh, they've got a couple of spots. Carlton, Mornington Peninsula. D O C. Yes. Like D O C pizza. Yep. Okay. And do you do you guys make stuff at home or is, is this like you just go out for pizza if you're getting it? No, I do the cheat pizza. I buy the base of tomato sauce and just and just Glorify, yeah, <laughs> and then glorify it with either mushrooms, with prosciutto, or smoked salmon. Um, yeah, Mate, the mushroom is one of my favourites as well. I used to get one of these every day years ago, and there's there's a place down here on uh, it's uh, on Hindley Street, and uh, I'd, it's called a Dangerous Mushroom, and I'd always order a uh, Dangerous Mushroom with extra danger. <laughs> they, they always just look at me funny, but I keep saying it. <laughs> but the caveat to that, it needs to be a mixture of mushrooms. I wouldn't okay. just pay a thirty dollar wood pie wood fire pizza for just one type of a mushroom on there that I can go to Woody's and buy a pack of mushrooms and just throw that on a pizza. Forever the value investor. Exactly. It's right. gotta be more. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Uh, Oliver Chung, thank you so much for jumping on the show today, mate. You've got an amazing story. I, I love the fact that you started with an enormous hex debt. You pushed past what most people would go, oh, I guess that's the roadblock, to not only build to a few properties, which would already be so cool to get, you've built that all the way to a portfolio of uh, $14 million plus, like lots of rental properties. And I don't think you've got any uh, any plans of stopping anytime soon, mate. I know this is probably not going to be the last time you're on the show. But Oliver Chung, thank you so much for jumping on the show. Thank you for having me.